So Halloween has come and gone again. Halloween, with the cut-out pumpkin faces and -and trick-and-treat children dressing up to pretend that they're something else. The time of playing ghosts and zombies is over. Halloween was Friday night. Except that that's not supposed to be the end of the story. You see, according to ancient lore, Hallow's Eve was supposed to lead into All Hallow's Day, just as Christmas Eve leads into Christmas. Hallow comes from an old English word that means a holy person, one who is very much faithful to God, someone who really lives faith, hope, and love. The beginning of November is to be celebrated each year as All Hallows or All Saints Day. Apparently it all goes back to the early Christians in Britain marking the end of the harvest and the beginning of winter. It's going to be tough. Winter can be a killer. And yet the witness of the Lord's people who have gone before us is that God does provide. So let's praise God for our fellows in the faith who are no longer with us, but whose testimony still lives on. All Saints' Day. Of course, most of us are not comfortable with the very idea of calling anyone a saint, except perhaps the dear grandmother we remember when we were very young, or the teacher who pointed us in the right direction when we really needed it, or, of course, as a joke and the title of a new comedy on the screen, To take the word seriously, though, implies perfection, super piety, and otherworldliness, which is unreal. Who can possibly be a saint? Except that it's in the Bible, in the New Testament, as a commonly used word for a fellow believer. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you are a saint. It was what you would be called as a member of any of the early Christian communities. A saint, a common word. That's what you were. You were a saint. But maybe history has been trying to tell us something in the way that word has evolved. Saint began as a term for all of us. But as the generations passed, saint came to describe the exceptional Christian, the genuine article, until for us it can now stand for excellence in the faith, Surely a saint can suggest excellence in the faith? In a society content with compromise, in a Western Christianity which others find very confusing with a diluted witness, in a Canadian church with limited vision and courage, There is a greater need than ever before for excellence in the faith, for saints. Uh, That's not the same as a hero. Heroes are human creations. We define them by our measurements. We choose them by our needs, such as someone who gives his life to defend us, and we are grateful, 
and that fits. But saints, on the other hand, are by God's grace and God's definition. They're a glimpse of what God really has in mind, what God can really do in a person's life. That doesn't mean it makes it any easier to recognize because we're not always good at seeing God's point of view. Maybe it depends as, on one measure as what a person has to cope with. And we see how he or she handles it. Maybe that will be a measure. How does the person respond to a crisis? Take Daniel, for example. Daniel in the story we just read a moment ago. Daniel was an immigrant, but not of his own choosing. He had been forced to move from one country to another. The land he came from had been overrun in war. His hometown had been sacked and burned by an army from the north, And he was one of the captives from Judah to Babylon. Daniel was a displaced person. He became a servant in the palace of Darius the king. He wasn't alone. The brightest young people among the prisoners taken were to be educated for the king's court. But Daniel caught the king's attention, and as time went by, he was increasingly given responsibilities. Years passed, and the word was out that Darius was planning to appoint Daniel as chief administrator of the whole kingdom. This foreigner had become the king's favorite. And the very idea that he might be put in charge was not a popular one among the rest of the civil service. They had to get rid of him. But Daniel's enemies could find no grounds for complaint, no evidence of negligence or corruption. He was a good man and faithful, a person of integrity. So they set him up. They appealed to the king's ego and persuaded him to to sign a decree that whoever prays to anyone, divine or human, for the next 30 days except to the king would be punished. In fact, he'd be thrown into the den of lions. Ah, it was clever. They knew the king could not resist the idea. They also knew that Daniel would never surrender his faith. So Darius signed the order. Daniel kept on praying to his God, and all the other officers of the court had accomplished what they wanted. High fives all around. Too late, Darius recognized what he had done. Daniel was caught praying on his knees, and the king could not make an exception. All he could say to Daniel was, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. And Daniel was thrown to the lions. There were lions in the Middle East, in the wild until the time of the Crusades. In fact, there were lions still roaming through the marshes along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in what we now know as Iraq until the 19th century. Big and dangerous, kings would keep several in captivity as a symbol of strength and power. You know the classic documentary, A pride of lions pulling down a water buffalo trying to run for its life. One grasps its tail to slow it down. 
Another grips its nose so it can't use its horns against them. And the rest of the lions swarm all over it until it falls, and then they can aim for the jugular. Frightening, strength, and power. The king couldn't sleep that night. He knew what the lions could do. Of course, when you stop to think about it, any lion's den is life-threatening. Any lion's den. And there are many kinds. Farley Mowat wrote his own memoirs of World War II. As a youngster hardly 20 years of age, he was a soldier in the battlefields of Sicily and Italy. His descriptions are graphic. Here's a little sample. The world exploded in an appalling cacophony of sound and fury. That barrage of shells was paralyzing. We could not escape. The noise, smoke, and confusion were so great that I was cut off from everyone, except Bates and a couple of men from Nine Platoon who were huddling behind the same broken wall that sheltered me. I did not know that several members of my platoon had already been wounded, nor that two of them had been obliterated by a direct hit on their shared slit trench. I only knew our situation was desperate and growing worse. End of quote. He called his book, And No Birds Sang and offered it as an indictment of the atrocity of war. In other words, a bloody lion's den. Let us never forget. Other lion's dens, of course, are much, much closer to home. Someone sent me the catalog from a company which produces motivational pictures for office walls in your place of business. Striking colored lithographs with messages printed beneath them, large, wooden-framed, double-matted for only $224.99. As I flipped the pages, I couldn't miss the magnificent picture of a maned lion lying in the dry grass and staring right at me with unblinking yellow eyes. And a gazelle standing in the background looking at the back of the lion as though wondering if he will be seen. And the motivational message for success in today's workplace is printed across the bottom. Quote, Every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will starve to death. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you'd better be running. (laughs) Or even closer to home, crises happen to us. Marriages blow up. Friends turn against you. You are ushered to the door without a job. Lion's dens are frightening. But Daniel survived. Somehow, the lions had no interest in crushing him. And Daniel could see no other explanation whatsoever except that God had rescued him, kept him from being destroyed, torn up 
by the lions. The story gives us two reasons for this rescue. The king comes running to the place with a hint of Easter morning in the air and calls out to Daniel behind the stone which has not yet been rolled away and calls out, are you all right? And Daniel answers from inside, yes, my God has shut the lions' mouths so that they would not hurt me because, O king, I have done no wrong. I was found blameless before him. God is looking for us to be faithful, to be persons of integrity, to do no wrong, to do no wrong. We are made in the image of God, and he is delighted when he can look at us as though we're a mirror and he can see a little bit of himself in us and our living. God expects us to do the right thing, the honest act, the loving touch, the good that will show that we have been with him. If we have been persons of integrity who have done no wrong, we have no reason to be afraid in the lion's den. Of course, there is a second reason that has to go with that. Daniel was taken out of the lion's den unharmed because he had trusted in his God, because of the relationship he had with the living God. It was his prayer life which had supposedly been his Achilles' heel. It was his praying that they thought would destroy him. His jealous enemies had used his praying to have him thrown to the lions in the first place. But in the process, Daniel had learned long and deeply to trust his God, to be absolutely open to him to receive his love, his grace, his truth, and to trust his God in everything. You cannot be thrown into whatever lion's den, faced by enemies in a feeding frenzy, and not be frightened, overwhelmed, shattered, if you have not learned to trust that God, too, is faithful. You learn to trust him by trusting him. God does answer prayer, but will we trust him, especially if he does not give us the answer we were looking for? God loves us. God is faithful. This is the point at which we need to note that the root meaning of the word saint, the original meaning, is separated to God's service. Separated to God's service. Standing out from the crowd, distinct from the mass, bright color against a gray background in order to do it God's way, the way of faith, the way of hope, the way of love. A sign of a saint is the freedom to trust God and to serve him as number one. Every one of us would like to be able to believe that we are living a story worth telling to our grandchildren. After we are gone, what will they tell the children about us? 
what have we taught them to measure as most important? And will they remember us for that? When will they talk about us? On our birthday? And they'll think about how many years we had? Will they talk about us at Christmas time? And they'll remember the family gatherings around the table when we were there. Maybe they will talk about us on Labor Day, how hard we worked, how successful we were, how far we got in the company. But I wonder, I wonder if they will ever talk about us at the beginning of November on All Saints Day when the call is to remember the saints who have gone before, the ones who made God real to the next generation. Let's be what we already are, saints, servants of the faithfulness of God. Let us pray. O oh God, in what incredible ways you can transform our stories. Help us to trust you in everything that we do and then translate that into faithfulness because you are faithful to us. And we will give you all the praise and the glory, world without end.